Hi all, this is Vasu Sham and welcome to another episode of Theoretically Podcasting. Today will be another solo episode where I discuss, uh, for your amusement, the relationship between self-avoiding random walks and supersymmetry. Now to be exact, this will be more BRSD than supersymmetry, but the title of the paper that I will be reviewing today by Parisian Sorolas is uh, Self-Avoiding Walks and Supersymmetry. So I'll stick with that uh, terminology. Now, first, I'll go over what the uh, objects of interest are, which are the self-avoiding random walks. So here is a nice animation by Rob Morris from the Wolfram Demonstrations Project uh, about what in two dimensions a self-avoiding random walk would look like. So as you can see, at every step, we have this one-dimensional curve that extends um, basically along a square lattice, which hasn't necessarily been drawn here. Right, so, so that with some probability, it jumps in one of the two directions it has available to it. Um, and one can think of these uh, elements, um, these, these dots at every lattice of the vertex, as some kind of repulsive element that makes it such that the uh, walk doesn't want to cross itself. So here's one illustration, and then here's another one I found, which is in a three-dimensional case by uh, Paul Alexandre Regis with the, uh, an obstacle. And so this is what it kind of looks like. And a more static picture of it is uh, provided here in um, my notes, which basically is um, a sort of re-rendition of the Parisi and Sorlas paper. The image is from Wikipedia, but um, I thought it'd be helpful to include here. So here, here's an example of a walk in two dimensions. And now uh, what we would like to understand are some properties of these walks, namely there is a phase where such walks are essentially space filling, meaning that with some likelihood, any closed path one can form within this walk uh, crosses that crosses the origin also crosses any other point. And there's a yet another phase where it's sort of confined to some region. Uh, and the phase transition between these two is the primary object of study in this paper. And there shall be a field theoretic model that reproduces the statistics of this uh, of this simple model, which is where the the BRSD or supersymmetry comes in. But first, let's just understand the um, statistical and mechanical problem in the absence of any uh, continuous fields. So they mention here that these uh, self-avoiding walks feature in the long scale properties of polymer chains. So that's, I guess, a use case for this for this model. And the fundamental quantity of interest is a sort of count of paths. So we have a sort of propagator, gx comma zero, which tells us uh, essentially how many paths run from zero to x. And there's a weight on each of these paths, which is given by mu times the length and g times the number of crossings that the path has with itself. So uh, mu and g are coefficients. They're the couplings of the theory. And g penalizes the paths intersecting themselves. And the ideal random chain has g equals 0. OK, so that's the setup. Now, we can choose to take this gamma to be a few different things. And then they mention what that is. So they look at. Uh, object G00, which is a sum of all closed paths going through the point zero, the origin. And then G sub two, zero comma X, which is to be distinguished with G sub nothing, X comma zero, is the sum of all closed paths that go through both points, the origin and X. And the weights are the same. All that differs is what we're calling gamma here. Now, this, these two quantities help us uh, capture the two kinds of phases that these random walks uh, can be in. 
And that's what they mention, which is that for mu larger than a certain critical value, G0x has an exponential fall off as x increases. As mu approaches mu sub c, the fall off of G0x follows a power law. And this is a sign of a second order phase transition. And uh, for mu smaller than mu sub c, dominant paths will fill up the entire space. So the ratio g sub 2 is 0, comma x uh, divided by g 0, 0 is basically the uh, number of closed paths passing through both the point O and some point x uh, divided by the number of closed paths passing through just the origin O. So that's a probability. Uh, and that probability being non-zero is a sign that we're in this phase. The At the critical point, rho goes to zero, meaning it plays the role of an order parameter. So as we approach the phase transition, we essentially have very few paths that actually reach uh, arbitrarily far if they pass through the origin. Close paths, that is. And that reflects the uh, power law decay of the uh, propagator between the point zero and point x. So these are two ways of looking at the same thing, but rho is a convenient quantity to use as an order parameter. So what follows is a kind of mean field analysis of the model that they have here. And it's um, mean field in a sort of very simple sense. So it's, it's worth going through. What they want to do is get a qualitative estimate of g0, zero for mu less than mu c and for small g. So they want to take a lattice at finite volume and take the thermodynamic limit in the end, as we tend to. So for a given configuration, we call gamma i the number of elements of the chain, which are links on the lattice passing through the point i. So it's the kind of the dots in, in the previous uh, animations. And the length l of the chain is just given by the sum of gamma i. And the number of intersections is given by this quadratic formula which is basically the sum of gamma i squared minus the length. Now, the key approximation trick is to use the uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality to write this as bound by um, L squared, so bound from below, by L squared over V minus L. And the L squared just comes from taking the sum into the square and then arguing that sum over i gamma i squared is greater than the uh, square of the sum. And what they're interested in is the regime where this inequality is saturated. So in the case where we have small g, we expect the chain to fill the entire space and cross itself several times. So rho, which now is nothing but length divided volume, right? So that rho, which is length divided volume, can be larger than one because we can essentially have the chain cross itself. Uh, so the length can be much, much larger than the volume if we can allow the chain to keep crossing itself multiple times. So here we find that we can argue for is saturated, for being the uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for this. So uh, at a first approximation, G00 is just given uh, by the following, which is just the result of plugging in uh, the Schwarz inequality and uh, saying that it's saturated. And basically what happens is that uh, we just look at the following sum to evaluate in the saddle point approximation. So we have sum over L of terms like this. And what we're going to do is um, look at the extrema. All right, so that gives us L, which is volume times mu minus mu C divided by G. And then uh, say we apply this, then what we're going to get is the following answer for g0, comma 0. And note that if we want to compute uh, L divided by V with uh, L given as the following, we'll obtain mu minus mu C divided by G, which is rho. So as mu approaches mu C, rho vanishes. So these points are just reiterated in the, in the, the article. So the sum will be dominated by the value uh, L0, which is exactly what we obtained. And then G00 is just going to be uh, the expression we obtained, which is V over 2G times mu minus mu C squared in the exponent. And our estimate for rho is indeed 
what we described. So they, they preface this by saying that these estimates are meaningful when we're far from the critical point. So mu is much smaller than mu c. And that's the behavior that we have. So that's great, uh, fits with our intuition. And what we now wanna do is look at a field theoretic model that uh, realizes this phase transition. And so we'll shift gears a little bit and I will ask for your faith in believing that the uh, following field theory actually captures this phase transition. So apparently it's been realized that the statistics of self-avoiding walks are closely related to the statistics of spin systems described by the following field theoretic model, which is the ON model uh, with uh, quartic uh, self-interaction. And the idea is that we're going to look at the limit where n goes to zero, which is a bit of the opposite limit that we hear a lot about in uh, modern high energy physics, which is n goes to infinity. Nonetheless, we can write expressions for the kinds of quantities we we're looking at. So the two point function is going to compute g zero comma x and the g sub two zero comma x quantity is computed by um, the following four point function at coincidence at two points. Now, the reason we don't have a one over z normalization is that the limit n goes to zero, z goes to one. So that's why we just have these expressions of the path with the path integral without the normalization by the partition function. So in these expressions, the diagrams where the spin indices at point x are contracted amongst themselves or here are proportional to n squared and they disappear in the limit when n goes to zero. So it's, it's sort of the opposite of uh, planar dominance that we're after here. And maybe that's a bit of a clue as to why these can possibly um, access, as in these, these, uh, this field theory can possibly access some of the physics of uh, polymeric chains or self-avoiding walks. I'd be very curious to hear uh, more about this model and please leave a comment uh, if you have a good reference. Anyway, the idea is that the quartic self-coupling uh, constant is analogous to G or proportional to G and M squared is a smooth function of mu and G. So there, there's some continuum limit details that have been left out, but that's that's basically the idea. Now, they write the partition function alternatively in the following form. So first they take n greater than one or generically being whatever it wants to be, introduce uh, hubbard stojanovich field alpha, and then they can do the functional integral over phi because it just ends up being quadratic. And they obtain the following expression, which is a Gaussian smearing of the following determinant. So it's as though we've given the uh, determinant an extra position dependent mass, and then we're smearing over it. Um, and uh, since we're doing uh, an integral over bosonic fields, we see that the determinant comes raised to the negative n, n over two power. And so in terms of this quantity, it's easy to see what um, g zero comma x becomes, which is nothing but the propagator smeared. And similarly with g sub two uh, and g sub g zero zero and so on. And now if you take n greater than or equal to one, this is just um, the ON model, which we're familiar with that models magnetic systems. So in the mean field approximation for m squared greater than zero, the correlation length is proportional to one over m. And for m squared equals zero, we reach a power law decay of the correlation function. Uh, and when m squared becomes negative, phi develops a non-zero expectation value, like in what we normally think of when we talk about uh, textbook spontaneous symmetry breaking. And so this corresponds to spontaneous breaking of on symmetry and spontaneous magnetization and n minus one long range excitations known as cold stone modes. The issue with the n goes to zero limit of the story apparently is that we get, for instance, a negative number of spin waves, um, which is peculiar, but it also is um, a bit of an indication that maybe some ghosts have a uh, role to play. So uh, that's exactly what they do. They introduce anti-commuting variables in the following section of their paper so as to uh, not have to take the n goes to zero limit. And that's that's how we get to some supersymmetry, or more technically, BRST symmetry. 
So they say that um, we want to stress the fact that n goes to zero is a limit that corresponds to a supersymmetry, which is being spontaneously broken at the phase transition point. And the fact that we can avoid the n equals zero limit is apparently something that was known. Uh, let's try to understand exactly how that comes to be. So first they define a sort of new model, which involves the uh, commuting bosonic fields, the anti-commuting fields of which there are pairs. And we have yet again, the haber stratanovich field and uh, quadratic terms in both the bosonic field, the n component bosonic field and these uh, anti-commuting fields and alpha squared. So then uh, again, we have just very similar expressions for g0 comma x and so on. Now, the point is that uh, they, they basically say that you just need to use the uh, known properties of um, Gaussian Grassmann integrals to obtain um, results that the results that we wanted, because basically equation 16 will become equivalent to equation 14. Right. So, so here you see we have the propagator being g zero comma x, and here uh, in sixteen, well, all we need to do to obtain that is both the phi and the psi integrals, and use the fact that the fermionic determinant comes with a positive power n. It's just that this n uh, is one half of uh, little n, the number of the bosonic fields. Great. Now moving on, what are the supersymmetry transformations? So these are the following mixings between phi and psi fields, uh, similarly with psi bar, presumably. And they say that, well, these transformations leave phi squared plus psi bar psi invariant. Note that this combination is exactly what appears linearly coupled to alpha. So they note that their statistics uh, A and B are commuting whereas C and D are anti-commuting, so as to make this transformation meaningful. And these are the supersymmetric transformations. And then what this says is that it's easy to see that the critical exponents obtained from this supersymmetric theory are the same as those obtained from the n goes to zero prescription. And to illustrate that point, what they try to say is that the n goes to zero prescription kills basically, so, so if, you, if you look at diagrams like this, where the dashed lines correspond to alpha propagators and uh, the filled lines correspond to phi propagators, then the n goes to zero limit kills those where you have uh, loops, the solid loops. Whereas when you have loops formed by the alpha propagators, they're sort of uh, safe under the alpha goes to zero, uh, under the n goes to zero limit. Now, in the supersymmetric model, we don't need this n goes to zero limit because there are basically closed fermionic loops that cancel against the bosonic loops. So the fact that the fermionic loop carries a minus one sign and the phi loops essentially just cancel against the fermionic loops means that we get the same result as we would in the n goes to zero limit. So the m fermionic degrees of freedom are equivalent to minus two m bosonic degrees of freedom. And that's just that's just because we need to introduce pairs of Grassmann variables in order to do the same integral, uh, so or rather to yeah to, to bring down the same determinant as we would with just one bosonic variable. Now let's get to the spontaneous breaking of the supersymmetry and what it has to do with any of this. So let's go back down to n equals two in the mean field approximation. And here we'll have uh, basically nothing but ordinary integrals to deal with. So that's what mean field does for us. It, it takes away the functional nature of the functional integral and we sort of reduce the calculation down to zero modes or mean fields. And so here they have the notation d sub two phi, um, I suppose for the two components of phi, at d psi d psi bar. And all that's left is the following expression where u is the potential. And so here what they've done is they've just um, eliminated alpha and kept phi psi and psi bar, which is why you have the following quartic potential. And this is an entirely ordinary integral. So first they say that Z is just going to equal one, basically because of uh, the following set of uh, manipulations. You have D two psi, U prime of uh, phi squared, E minus U. So definitionally that's one. 
and this is just all evaluated at saddle point anyway. Then phi squared and phi squared phi squared are basically g sub two and then g sub well g zero comma x and then g sub two zero comma x are evaluated in the following manner, and these are all saddle point evaluations as well. So they replace this expression by just the saddle point evaluations of the of the integrand, and that'll come with an extra factor of the volume. Um, basically because you're going to have to account for the volume uh, even in the mean field, even in the mean field limit. And so what they mean by u sub min is basically u evaluated at phi at the minimum, hence the saddle point. The fermionic integrals have been performed exactly. So there's no saddle point approximated, uh, approximation for them. They're just uh, simple identities because these are all Gaussian integrals with Grassmann variables. So it's fairly straightforward to deal with them. And now we have a good sense for what's going on. So when m squared is less than zero, we have that phi squared uh, at the minimum is given by uh, the ratio m squared to lambda. And that u at the minimum is given by m squared whole squared divided by four lambda with a minus sign. And we see that g is zero, zero diverges exponentially as the volume goes to infinity. And that the ratio between these two, that is our rho is m squared over lambda. And much like in the previous case, as we take m squared to zero, we find that the uh, ratio g2 to g, g00, zero zero, which is rho, goes to zero. So this supersymmetric model reproduces the results we were expecting from the qualitative discussion at the beginning of the paper. That's sort of the punchline. Uh, so they say if we consider the full model developed around the saddle point, we see the appearance of long-range bosonic and fermionic excitations. So there are goldstone modes and goldstenos, or goldstone fermions. And so they say, let's consider the case where the supersymmetry is explicitly broken uh, by the presence of an external field H. Then Z is not 1, it's 1 plus H over phi min times e to the power minus U times V. Then they see that, well, the free energy really has the following funny property, that if we take h to zero first and then take v to infinity, we get zero. However, if we take v to infinity first and then take h to zero, we get u min. And so free energy is not a continuous function of the parameter h. We have a zeroth order phase transition. So um, then they talk a little bit more about what, uh, yeah, well, what one needs to do by realizing this with this many bosonic fields and this many anti-commuting fields. So um, here they just comment on the fact that they don't really understand what the meaning is of these uh, Goldstone and Goldstino excitations, but they have succeeded in reproducing the qualitative physics of self-avoiding random walks through this uh, spontaneous breaking of supersymmetry. And this seems, uh, I suppose, fun, but but just to connect it back to, well, why is this related to spontaneous supersymmetry breaking? Well, yeah, normally you might recall that we have some auxiliary field um, and its VEV uh, being zero or not is sort of an indication of whether supersymmetry is preserved or not. And then that's what this um, phi squared field really is if we went back to our uh, definition for what alpha does. So the, the fact that they're writing everything in terms of phi squared and not alpha might obscure the fact that this has something to do with spontaneous supersymmetry breaking, but ultimately it's the same story. And now there is a more general treatment of this and uh, related topics that I found um, in the following uh, article. So, here is a paper by Stam Nicolas and uh, Zarkak, uh, where they look at basically Langevin processes, and then they develop a uh, supersymmetric or sort of BRST version of the stochastic path integral at equilibrium, and show that there's what they call a world point supersymmetry appearing in these models and then discuss how it's spontaneously broken by fermionic zero modes. And, and that's essentially what happened there in the mean field approximation that Parisi and Solas were dealing with. So in their mean field approximation, we no longer had any fluctuations. So you know, there was no sense in which there was even a world line. So it was kind of like a world point supersymmetry because these were all ordinary integrals we were dealing with. And the sense in which the supersymmetry was broken was, in, was through 
a certain auxiliary field expectation value, which was you know related to the expectation value of some regular fields um, by elimination of that auxiliary field. So those expectation values were non-zero, uh, signaling the spontaneous breaking of the SUSY. Now, just to get a bit of a sense, just to go through this a little bit more slowly, let's try and go through uh, their discussion of world point supersymmetry. So what they say is that we have a stochastic process driven by um, the following Langevin equation, where there's a um, a potential, which in this case is not really like a potential energy. It's, it's really more the exponent in the equilibrium distribution. So we can call it the log of the equilibrium distribution U plus a noise, Gaussian noise eta. So this is just the weak theorem uh, statement and the statement that the noise is indeed Gaussian. And uh, so we'll assume that U is ultra local, so it doesn't contain any derivatives with respect to tau. So it's it's really a gradient flow. And so at equilibrium, so when we take x infinity, which is the tau goes to infinity limit of x, the stochastic process and Langevin equation takes the following form. So basically we just have uh, eta given by du over dx. x is, again, this, this infinite value, x infinity. Uh, infinite time value, not literally infinite value. So the idea is that, well, du dx, right, so the gradient of the equilibrium, uh, log of the equilibrium distribution is drawn from a Gaussian distribution. That's the idea. And that can be captured by the following partition function. Right, so the the partition function now is dx d eta, e to the power minus eta squared, and we have a delta function imposing the equality between eta and du dx. And so, um, note that there's going to be uh, the following. Did, well, there's going to have to be a, a certain uh, Jacobian appearing when we when we eliminate the eta integral. And we get the following Gaussian integral, well, uh, Gaussian structure with respect to the gradient du dx times this times this Jacobian. So we need that u, the Hessian, uh, u double prime of x is non-zero for all values of x. So um, here they say if u double prime can vanish, then the second equality does not hold, which is well-known fact from Feshman calculus. We want the partition function, so we want to part. Uh, partition the domain of integration into intervals where the Jacobian is of fixed sign. The points where the Jacobian vanishes are excised and the integrals are computed by a limiting procedure. And so this move is at the bottom of all of the supersymmetry breaking, um, all the supersymmetry breaking story. So so that's, that's what their paper really goes into. So... Um, yeah, they say that in fact it describes this system describes the boundary degrees freedom of supersymmetric quantum mechanics in one space dimension. So let's let's proceed. So let's let's see. So note that they have a discussion here about um, the so-called Nikolai map that relates f and du dx, uh, and they talk about how it's inverted. So F is the uh, kind of auxiliary field that I just mentioned in passing. And then this relation is the kind of thing that would relate it to some function of X itself, which is like phi in our previous discussion. Before that, let's get to what they mean by world point supersymmetry. So it all just comes from exponentiating the determinant as you might expect. And that exponentiation is done through introducing uh, anti-commuting variables, psi sub A. And so they they say here that these anti-commuting anti variables are not ghosts, but they're just as physical as X. Okay. So they don't worry about spin statistics theorem because, well, this is an ordinary integral. Um, okay, so the effective action is, has the following form. There was du dx squared from before. And there's an additional uh, term that accounts for the determinant. Now, we linearize this piece by introducing an auxiliary field F. And that gives us the following structure. And this quantity, um, right, so, so they, they talk about what happens in field theory. So 
uh, with this property. So they say that F has an ultra local propagator, which were it not the case, F would be a ghost. So, so caveat that. But now we have an entire action, which is linear in du dx, quadratic in F, and has the following a determinant term involving the fermions. And here are the supersymmetry transformations. So note that in particular, F under delta vanishes. So having a non-zero expectation value of F is a way to know that there's a breaking of the supersymmetry. So um, they say when expectation value of F is non-zero, these relations imply that the fermion becomes a zero dimensional avatar of the Goldsteino. Great. So um, now let's sort of move on. So the, this map is something that they do talk about a lot, which is the equation of motion for F. Well, in other words, it was the way F was introduced, and this is called a Nikolai map, or it's like a zero-dimensional version of the Nikolai map, and that'll be significant in, in the rest of their treatment. Um, so they they do mention that to understand what happens to the supersymmetry in this formalism, we need to know if the following object has zero modes. Because it's clear that the action certainly has supersymmetry manifest, or the BRST symmetry manifest, but the partition function needn't. So they just talk about the fact that, well, this is certainly uh, good. They start with a cubic uh, superpotential, right? So that's du dx. Um, and well, u is cubic, and so du dx is the following quadratic object. And then they integrate out psi, um, well, psi and psi bar, which they've written as uh, this following two component object. And they find the following um, absolute value, m squared plus lambda x in the integral. Great. So this quantity vanishes at x equals minus m squared over lambda. So you see that, well, this causes issues. Because if we try to compute correlation functions, then we can't quite do so because the naive action is not bounded from below as x approaches minus m squared over lambda. And also note that um, the classical action, so to speak, which is what we get by eliminating f, has a double wall structure, which degenerate minimized x equals 0, and at this uh, not so nice point, x equals minus 2m squared over lambda. Uh, or, well, that's not the not, not so nice point. The not so nice point has a maximum. So at this maximum, they say, the mass of the fermion vanishes. So, and they say at the minima, the chiral symmetry is broken. So there's a lot of quotes because this is a one-dimensional integral. I mean, th these are all just one-dimensional integrals. Um, great, so they say that let's look at what happens in perturbation theory. So if we study perturbation theory, then we can only access the vicinity of the minima and we should find unbroken supersymmetry. So this would be the mass of the fermion, the mass squared of the boson, and these two should be the same. So mass squared of, or the mass of the boson, mass of the fermion, when you take squares on both sides, should be the same. Uh, now, broken chiral symmetry, and okay, so, sorry, the, the, yeah, that, that's, that's the story near the minimum. So no hint of any instability at the maximum. Um, but then when we try to compute moments beyond perturbation theory, uh, we will generate configurations around the maximum where the Jacobian vanishes. So basically they're saying if you tried to put this uh, on a computer, did a Monte Carlo simulation, we would see issues coming from the fact that they have uh, that there's this maximum where the Jacobian vanishes. So um, here they say in this case, we need to understand whether the theory is irrevertibly sick beyond perturbation theory or can be salvaged. And so they say, well, this is not, we suspect this isn't sickness, but it's a sign of health. Um, if we, tr we try to integrate out a massless particle, so it shouldn't be surprising that we run into trouble. So let's, let's dive into that. So these are zero dimensional avatars of zero modes of the Dirac operator. And that basically tells us something about the zero modes of the determinant that the, the Jacobian that, that appeared in the, in the integral. So they say, well, if we wanted to 
deal with them properly, we would omit the point x equals minus m squared over lambda when we evaluate the Jacobian. And then we would integrate over the zero mode. So what does that amount to in the following? Well, we excise this point. So we integrate up to that point from minus infinity minus epsilon. And then starting from uh, minus m squared over lambda plus epsilon, we go up to infinity. And note that we have two different signs across this. And you want to use this expression to compute moments of x to the power p, so any kind of moments of the bosonic field. And so you see the fact that we're not integrating over the entire real line, and the fact that we've deleted this epsilon interval means we've broken the supersymmetry explicitly. And so we want to understand what happens as epsilon goes to zero and see whether in that limit the supersymmetry is recovered or not. And well, it is not. And they say it's not hard to see why. And that's because the zero of the Jacobian is not also a zero of the action. Right. So were this the case, the supersymmetry would be recovered. So let's let's dive into exactly what this means. So in equation 16, the Jacobian no longer vanishes in each interval, in each integral. So we can perform the change of variables f equals such and such, which is applying this so-called Nikolai map. And in each uh, integral, we obtain these expressions. So what we have now is two times integral df, e power minus f squared over two, but not from zero to infinity, but instead from minus m power four over two lambda plus epsilon squared lambda over two. All that just comes from plugging the value of x at the tricky point and then putting that back into this expression for f. So for epsilon finite, even if we take the limit epsilon goes to zero with m and lambda fixed, the lower limit of integration tends to a finite value minus m squared minus m power four over two lambda. So the fact that this doesn't just go to, um, well, basically minus infinity or well, really to zero, right? So, so ideally it would go to zero, uh, but here that doesn't happen. So they say this signals supersymmetry breaking in that limit. So um, they also say that, well, as epsilon goes to zero, the curve stays fixed uh, and the minimum of the right-hand side is not equal to zero. And then they say, well, they can arrange that by, by doing some change of variables. And now you see that uh, the change of variables, you find that the C introduced has to be m power four over two lambda. Uh, and that's the value of the coefficient of the linear term when f becomes a perfect square, uh, whose double zero coincides with the zeros of the Jacobian. This is just dealing with change of variables again. But note that this still doesn't restore the supersymmetry because we have a non-trivial VEV for f. So the domain having a boundary, right? So making that zero and not minus infinity means that the following ratio is not zero. And so um, this is the way in which the fermionic zero modes lead to spontaneous supersymmetry breaking, which uh, is kind of the same phenomenon at play as in the paris or less paper. So, Let's see what happens when we deal with the quartic superpotential now. So meaning U has a quartic term, so the gradient of U is going to have a cubic. Um, so now the Jacobian is positive definite, therefore the partition function becomes a Gaussian integral centered at zero, whose integration range is the whole real axis. Supersymmetry is realized in the Wigner mode. Great, but if M squared is less than zero, then the Jacobian vanishes at two points which are the square root of minus two m squared over lambda. Its sign is positive outside the interval minus two plus square root of minus two m squared over lambda and negative within. Therefore, we have the following partition function. So again, there's a region of excision. And then once again, make a change of variables, do all this, turn it into a quadratic expression with respect to f. But then note what happens when we deal with the various integration bounds. So the limit epsilon goes to zero is smooth and the contribution of the middle integral cancels the contribution from, from the overlap between the other two integrals. And we're left with an integral over the whole real axis and supersymmetry is restored. So 
their basic point is that, well, based on what the super potential is, we may or may not have um, supersymmetry breaking. And uh, that they say is that this analysis settles the issue of supersymmetry breaking for these models. And um, they then go on to analyze what the consequences are for the moments of the scalars. So again, everything done here was based on moments of the auxiliary field F. And what they then want to do is relate those moments to moments of the scalar through the Nikolai map. Uh, you want to realize this as a sort of uh, Schrodinger Dyson equation. And uh, well, so they, they do this analysis painstakingly and uh, find some nice results for basically the moments of the scalar. In the case that we had uh, in the previous expression. So, so well, okay, just to, just to go full circle, note that they actually do this explicitly. Uh, in some cases, and they show uh, how the scalar moments uh, and their non-vanishing is related to the non-vanishing of the expectation values of the auxiliary fields. And that kind of analysis is what relates the um, phi-squared expectation value and the phi-squared phi-squared expectation value in the previous Surlas uh, uh, Parisi paper to uh, supersymmetry breaking. So they, they sort of jumped ahead in this analysis. So, so I highly recommend that um, Nicolas uh, et al. paper. And there's just a lot of works by Nicolas apparently that studies the general phenomenon of emergent supersymmetry in stochastic dynamics. So yeah, this is, this is a really fun um, read for me. And I hope that um, it was enjoyable to you too. Uh, and this is a theme I would like to come back to because there are a lot of fun games to play with the relation between stochastic systems and uh, supersymmetry or BRST invariance and its spontaneous breaking. And so hopefully next time we can discuss what happens when we're not in zero dimensions, but at least we go up to one. Thank you all for your attention. And uh, if you like this video, leave a like, comment, share, subscribe. And uh, see you next week for another episode of Theoretically Podcasting.